Good evening. It's good to have all of you. Um, if this is your first time coming to an Explore Simpson series, we would love to have all of you open up your chat box. Um, so if you go ahead at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little a uh, little button that says chat. If you open that up, that opens up the chat box. Go ahead, introduce yourself so we know who's here and we could um, register you. So just go ahead and say your name, your hometown, uh, what year you are in school and any kind of like academic or personal interest that you might have that would be helpful for us or for the presenters. So go ahead and just type that info in now. And Seth, you can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Okay, we will do. So we'll be using the chat feature um, throughout this meeting. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the actual program, um, you can go ahead and just type them in in the chat box. And then at the end, we'll do live Q&A. So if you feel like you want to jump on with your video and audio, you can do that. Um, Mark, one of our counselors will be on and he will also um, read through your questions. So you can ask everyone in the chat and just post them there. You can ask them directly um, to myself or to Seth or to Mark and we'll get a notification and see all of that. So feel free just to use that chat box throughout and if you want to engage with each other, you're more than welcome to do that too. Alrighty, so this is uh, one of many of an Explore Simpson series. Tonight we're going to focus on civic engagement and all of the awesome ways that you are able to engage um, politically um, or with activism or advocacy um, on and off Simpsons campus. We have a really, really engaged student body and staff and faculty. Um, it's one of the ways that we all actually engage with each other, which is really cool. Um, and we have uh, someone on tonight who will be hosting the call with me. Um, my name is Madeline Cano. I'm the Assistant Director for Diversity, Inclusion, and Access. I work in the admissions office um, and I primarily do community outreach and work with multicultural um, populations. So you might see me at your high school or um, at some sort of public event, but um, I also work with students uh, when they're on campus as well. So excited to be here with you. If you have any questions for me, again, throw them in the chat um, and I will have Seth just introduce himself really quick as well. And good evening, everyone. My name is Seth Anderson, and I serve as director of the John C. Culver Public Policy Center at Simpson College. And we are a nonpartisan politics and policy center that provides opportunities for all members of the Simpson community to be engaged with civic life, public policy, politics, the laws that affect us all, and those kinds of issues. Awesome. We're super excited to have you. Um, Seth's going to share some really amazing information with you tonight about ways that you're going to be able to engage when you're on campus as a student. Um, I'll run through the agenda real quick if you want to jump to the next slide. So tonight, if you've been on these Explore Simpson series before, we keep the agenda pretty similar. Um, we are going to just run through some basic admissions information. So some of this stuff might be a little more relevant for seniors. So if you're graduating this year and you're going to college in the fall, there's some action steps for you to take. Um, but I'll, we're, we are going to have some events dedicated to junior. So if you're graduating in 2021, um, certainly jump on some of those junior events. And then um, once I finish with the admissions and financial aid piece, I will let Seth take over and he'll talk about all of his content. And then we will open it up for uh, Q&A at the end. Alrighty, so let's jump right into it with some admissions information. If you want to go ahead and skip to the next slide after this. So just some basic information. Again, if this is your first time joining us, if you haven't been able to visit with us on campus, we do just like to go over just some really great touch points that make Simpson unique and make us stand out. So I think the biggest thing that I really love about our campus and our community is the size. And that's what makes us very unique is that you have a very intimate experience at Simpson. It's one of the things that students say that they love the most is those relationships that they have, not only with faculty and staff, but also with their fellow students. So uh, there's about 1,200 full-time undergraduate students. We do have a couple of continuing and graduate programs that are available as well. Um, so more or less full-time for those programs, we have just under 2,000 students. Um, in terms of what your class sizes might look like, this varies, but on average, you're going to see that your class sizes will be about 12 Per, per faculty member. And those really just kind of vary depending on the class that you're in. So for example, if you're 
your freshman year and you're in your introductory science courses, um, you might actually be in a larger lecture hall, maybe with 30 or 40 students. Um, our largest lecture hall hold, holds 100 folks. So it really just depends on some of that coursework. But as you get into your junior and senior year and those smaller classes or your labs, you actually might even have less than 12. You're really going to get that one-on-one -on -one time with your professor. Um, and they're really just going to get to know you really well, which is going to help you when you're graduating and pursuing a career. In terms of programs, we have over 80 different majors, minors, and pre-professional programs. Simpson students are very, very multifaceted. It's really common for a lot of our students to um, pursue multiple passions. A lot of students have double majors, some even have triple majors, and that is all very manageable within the four years that you are at Simpson because of the liberal arts um, education and the way that we have it set up. So you'll really work closely with your academic advisor your freshman year to kind of just create that path, that road path for you to see what the future looks like. And you'll have exposure to a variety of different coursework that you'll be able to explore. So you won't be just you know, stuck in one particular major, you'll be able to take courses in a variety of different areas. Uh, after graduation, success rate is excellent. Um, almost 100% of our students um, either attended graduate school um, or had a secure career in their preferred field within six months of graduation. So it's a great investment. You know, Simpson really does a great job with their academic programming. And again, those relationships really set you up for success afterwards. Another reason that our students are so successful is that we have a really great internship program. So um, our Career Development Center is very um, hands-on and really committed to kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with you in terms of developing your resume, practicing interview skills, and helping you secure internships. A lot of our students will do at least one internship, if not more. I think about 80% of our students that complete at least one internship while they're here on campus. And that can include summer research programs. So we're very flexible in terms of um, being able to use internships and research programs for credits, which is why a lot of students are able to pursue a variety of different um, passions. And probably another great and most important part is that we are very committed to having cost-effective education and we know that college is a large investment for everybody and so we want to make sure that you all know that all of our students will receive some sort of financial aid um, and we'll actually have a session on that at the end of May so if you're curious about more details about what financial aid looks like um, you definitely can check that out with our financial aid director Tracy Pavon. All right we'll go ahead and jump to the next slide. So this, these are action steps specifically for seniors. Um, if you haven't done this already, you know, you know, don't worry. Uh, the timeline sort of is changing, obviously, with all the things that are going on in these unprecedented times. But these are just some things that are important for you to know. So if you have not done so already, go ahead and send us your FAFSA so that way we're able to lock in your financial aid package for you and get that out to you. Your FAFSA, if you're um, not a senior yet and you're an underclassman, your FAFSA basically is um, tells Simpson College and all the other colleges that you're applying to um, what your income level is and what your need and your, your need might be for some financial aid. So it just really helps the federal government, the state government, and any colleges that you apply to um, see what kind of financial impact um, tuition might have on you and your family. So it's really important that you're able to submit that to us, and that's how we base all of our financial aid package. If you have not set up a meeting with myself or one of your admissions counselors to talk about your financial aid or to talk about Simpson in general, I highly recommend that. We have set up individual virtual visits, so kind of similar how you would on campus. You just go to simpson.edu slash visit and you click on the individual virtual visit link and you're able to choose any date, Monday through Friday um, from 9 to 4 p.m. You can meet with myself, you can meet with faculty, you can meet with folks like Seth. Um, and really just have those virtual one-on-one -on -one sessions to talk about um, what's really important for you personally and what you're looking to do um, and how we can help you at Simpson. And then finally, once you're ready to commit to Simpson, um, we ask that you pay your $200 enrollment deposit and that allows you access to your SC Connect portal. And your SC Connect portal uh, basically will allow you to submit all of your important documents that we're going to need in order to bring you in as a freshman. So, um, housing, obviously very important. Your housing survey is going to be on there. All your health forms are going to be on there. And then you're going to be able to, to register for um, orientation and class registration. And that's going on right now. So if you have not paid your $200 deposit yet, 
please, I encourage you to do that now because we are approaching those SOAR dates and spots are filling up for those classes. And we want you all to be able to get the classes that you want. So the sooner you pay your $200 deposit, the sooner you can register for those classes and lock in your spot. All right, go ahead and jump to the next slide. So we've been doing a lot of these Explore Simpson series. Uh, we want to make sure that you're able to still see all of the awesome pieces that we have to offer you. So this is just a quick schedule of the upcoming events that we have going on. We've been doing these all throughout the spring and I see some familiar faces on the attendance list tonight. So go ahead and check this out. If there's anything that is of interest to you, you certainly can check that out. We'll be doing some more different events in the summer. Um, as well as in the fall for those of you who are 2021 or 2022. So you definitely can log on for some of those. Um, we'll continue doing virtual visits regardless if we're back on campus or not. We've really liked this platform a lot. So um, we wanna be accommodating of everybody knowing that folks might not be able to get to campus sometimes if you live out of state or if you live far away. So um, we wanna make things accessible for you. So we'll definitely continue doing these virtual options. All right. Next slide, please. And then most importantly, if you want to stay up to date, I think the best way obviously in today's day and age is just to connect with us on social media. So right here you have all of our um, handles that you can check out, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. All of these sessions are actually going to be uploaded on the Explore Simpson playlist, which is on our YouTube channel. So just go find Simpson College on YouTube and you can see all of the past sessions if you've missed some of them. We record every session we're recording right now so it's just really nice to be able to go back and check out those sessions on your own time um, and you'll get up to date with us on anything that's happening with simpson college if you just follow us on any of these platforms or you can also use the one simpson hashtag and that really will connect you to a lot of students that are using that hashtag and what's going on on campus all righty with that being said i will close out my portion and we'll turn it over to seth for civic engagements all right, thank you very much, Maddie. Um, so uh, as Maddie mentioned, Simpson has a reputation of being a very civically engaged campus and a campus community. So what, what does that mean? What does civic engagement mean to all of you? Encourage you to put questions and thoughts into the chat box. Mark will be monitoring those and we'll come back to those at the end of this brief presentation that I have. Um, at Simpson College, civic engagement means a lot of different things. It means the work that students do in class. The, um, the general education curriculum that Simpson uses um, is actually called the Engaged Citizenship Curriculum. So it's focused on helping students acquire skills um, and knowledge that will make them productive members of society. So at Simpson, civic engagement takes the form of students raising their own awareness about important issues. And those can be, and raising awareness among other students as well. Now, those can be issues at you know, the global, the scale, say climate change, or the national scale, immigration reform, down to the state, local level, and quite often issues that are important just to our campus community. Um, so a good example of that would be all of the students that have been active in environmental sustainability movements um, they've had great success in working with uh, the college to make more sustainable improvements. So putting in a more efficient um, solar and geothermal power sources on campus, um, having a robust recycling program. Uh, one of my students a few years ago uh, uh, reclaimed a section of vacant land that the college owed and planted a native, pra a native prairie grasses. Um, in, in uh, partnership with the city and the college. And that's made a lasting impact. You can still go and see that, uh, that little section of prairie on Simpson's campus. Um, we also offer a lot of great opportunities for students to be, become active or remain active as volunteers in the community. Um, many students who come to Simpson already have a strong background of volunteering, of community service um, through high school, through uh, churches and other faith-based faith organizations. Um, and we extend those opportunities to students through something called the Wesley Service Scholars Program. Um, and under that program, students um, commit to doing, um, I believe it's 80 hours of community service um, in a given semester. 
and they earn an additional scholarship, uh, so additional financial aid um, in exchange for doing this really robust volunteer program. Um, more in my area, um, I work with students who are uh, really eager to do a lot of political activism, um, getting involved in, in politics, public policy, important issues in civic life. Um, and how we extend these opportunities and, and bring them to life are through a lot of different programs. Um, uh, just a few examples of the programs that we've done recently. We have launched a new program called the Simpson Dialogue Series. And we launched this back in January of 2019. Uh, the first program we did in conjunction with the college's annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, commemorations. Uh, we brought in an outside speaker who talked about the importance of community dialogue. And then we sat down in small groups. Uh, we had trained facilitators, many of whom are students, um, who, who received special training to facilitate dialogue sessions. And these are a little, they're different than maybe some of you have been involved in speech and debate, um, or you've had, you know, those, those kinds of experiences. This format's a little bit different. Um, it's a structured dialogue where there's a facilitator to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak and that it doesn't turn into a debate or a lot of crosstalk or trying to persuade people to your viewpoint, but really just listening to what your fellow students and community members feel about a particular issue and then responding with how you feel as well. Um, and it's a really productive way of breaking down barriers, getting people to understand that folks have other viewpoints and they have valid reasons for coming to their views. Um, and it, it really is a, a way to practice listening skills and to promote open dialogue on some really challenging issues. And we talk about issues of social justice, racial justice, economic justice. Um, we talk about issues of um, sexual violence. These are not you know, light topics, they're, they're difficult ones, but they're the kinds of things that we all need to learn how to talk about in an open and productive way. So we've done several of these dialogue uh, programs and we look forward to doing more in the future and to training more student leaders to facilitate dialogues. Um, the Culver Center that I direct, we host a lot of different substantive programs all year long on different public policy issues. And we cover everything from international relations down to very, very local issues. Um, this flyer is from a program we did uh, last April about um, economic development and sustainability, particularly in, in smaller cities and towns in Iowa and throughout the Midwest. So, you know, a lot of small towns have lost, um, lost businesses or jobs. How do they rebuild their economy, um, but do so in a sustainable way? Um, and that can mean environmental sustainability, um, so using better building materials, things like that. And it can also just mean, how do you sustain a community over the long term? How do you make smart decisions about what your tax levels are and how to use people's tax money, um, et cetera? So we do a, a whole bunch of programs like that. We invite in expert speakers uh, from around the state and across the country. We always have a bipartisan group of speakers. So whenever we have a politician, we have invite politicians or elected officials, we always make sure that we have equal balance between Democrats and Republicans. Um, some of our other programs that are really fun, uh, we do uh, a series called Pizza and Policy. Um, and this is really led by students. Uh, they select the topics, they invite the speakers. Um, I just, or I go and pick up the pizza. Uh, and I get to enjoy watching the students' uh, work come to life. We enjoy pizza together, and we hear from speakers. Sometimes they're, they're students who've done research in an area. Sometimes it's professors at Simpson, or sometimes it's outside speakers. And what we do here is we do a deep dive on a particular issue that's a really a hot topic, you know, in the news that people are talking about. And so we can do a little bit more um, uh, of an in intensive exploration of a particular issue. This example from last December um, is a program we did uh, on the impeachment process. Uh, this was while President Trump was um, going through the impeachment in the House of Representatives, and we had a professor of history and a professor of political science who talked about 
the history of impeachments, how does, how, do, how does Congress prosecute an impeachment, what are the rules, what are the precedents, all of that. So it's very informational. Um, it's not political uh, in, the, in terms of you know, promoting a political particular viewpoint or ideology. It's more trying to get people to understand all the nuances of complex issues. Our students also have a lot of fun leading events like political trivia night. Um, last November, we had a really fun night. Lots of snacks and prizes were given away and um, students who are real political junkies got to uh, show uh, their knowledge of political trivia. Um, a lot of the work that we do at the Culver Center uh, focuses on voter registration. Uh, this is incredibly important. Um, all of you um, are part of a generation, if you include the millennials and, and the, the, the first edge of the Gen Z generation that you are all part of, you are the biggest voting bloc in the country now. There are more of you than there are baby boomers, um, which is the biggest generation in American history. There's certainly more of you than there are Gen X. My, my generation's a very small one sandwiched in between two very large generations. Um, so what we do is we work with all students multiple contacts from the moment a, a first year student sets foot on campus all the way through uh, their through graduation. We work with students to make sure that they're registered to vote, that they understand what their voting rights are, that they feel comfortable maybe voting early or absentee, or if they decide to wait until election day, we provide support, we give students rides to the polls, and we do this in a completely nonpartisan way. What that means is when you do this work in voter registration, whether you're on a college campus or anywhere else, you have to register everyone to vote, no matter what political party there are. You can't discriminate against someone because you disagree with their viewpoint. The idea is to just get everyone in the pool. Um, and good things happen when young people get politically energized um, and they start to exercise their right to vote. Um, Here's a, a slide that shows a couple of the students that, that I've worked with um, through the Culver Center. Uh, they've displayed great leadership, gotten wonderful experience leading voter registration drives at Simpson. Uh, we work with a couple of national organizations, the Andrew Goodman Foundation and the Campus Election Engagement Project. And they're fantastic to work with because they provide resources and materials and support. And students actually earn a stipend. They, you earn pay for doing this um, nonpartisan voter registration work. Uh, you can earn up to $1,000 a year um, from these national organizations um, and you know, working you know, closely with me and others on campus who do this kind of work. Uh, we were really pleased in 2018, during the last uh, general election, the midterm elections of 2018, um, we were recognized as having the highest voter registration rate of any campus in the state of Iowa. Uh, we had over 87% of our students registered to vote. So we received a nice award for that. Um, and we had a fantastic turnout of our student voters in 2018. Um, as the graphic shows, we had just over 50% of our students at Simpson uh, voted in the 2018 midterm elections. And you know, that may seem to some people like a low number. It's actually very, very high for a midterm election, and it's especially high for this age group. Um, the national average for college age voters in 2018 was about 39%, so we beat that by 11%. But more importantly, um, if you look down in the bottom right corner there, you see in 2014, 34.5% uh, of our students voted, um, which was still better than the national average, but not, not, not great. Uh, we improved that significantly by nearly 15 percentage points to get to um, over 50% voting rate, which is just fantastic. And, and we're hoping to continue that trend line. Of course, in Iowa, um, we have the privilege of hosting the first in the nation Iowa caucuses, which bring a lot of attention, a lot of all the presidential candidates, all the media circus and everything that comes to town. And Simpson is always at the center of that. Um, I'm gonna run through a few slides here that, that showcase some of the wonderful opportunities that our students have got in this most recent, uh, the current presidential election cycle. 
Um, here's a photo of one of our students, uh, Jalen, introducing Senator Elizabeth Warren at an event, uh, packed house in our Black Box Theater. Um, and here's another one of my students, Eli, from Colorado. Uh, they got to introduce Senator Bernie Sanders uh, before a big rally that he did um, late last fall. <coughs> Pardon me. We had Vice President Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee now. Um, he spoke to a packed house in, in Great Hall, or one of our older um, event spaces on campus. And we had Mayor Pete Buttigieg from South Bend, Indiana, who got an awful lot of enthusiasm amongst young voters in Iowa this cycle. Uh, and again, one of our students was able to introduce uh, Mayor Pete before his, his talk. Um, of course, this year it was mainly Democrats running for president because President Trump doesn't have a lot of challengers, but the photo here does show the, the one Republican pre presidential candidate um, who made an appearance at Simpson this year, uh, the day before the Iowa caucuses, former Congressman Joe Walsh of Illinois uh, did a small event on campus. And here are some members of the Simpson College Republicans, um, including one Culver Fellow uh, who, who uh, helped to put on that event. Um, and in 2016, when uh, the presidency was open um, and we had a lot of candidates in both parties, we hosted as many Republican candidates for president, uh, actually more <laughs> than we did Democratic candidates. So it's all very balanced. It's all very bipartisan. Um, just a few words on the Culver Fellowship. So this is a scholarship program run out of uh, the Culver Center. Um, and it's really covers a lot of areas of interest. Um, it's kind of designed for students who are interested, obviously, in politics and public policy, um, but also international relations. We've had students that have, um, alumni that have gone on to work at the State Department and uh, work at different embassies. Um, uh, we have a lot of students that are interested in going to law school. Um, and many of them end up in the Culver Fellows Program because they get great exposure to public policy, government, law, um, and a lot of legal topics that prepare them for law school. We also have a lot of history majors, English majors, journalism, um, economics, um, mathematics. So you don't have to be a political science major by any stretch to be uh, eligible for the Culver Fellowship. What it really is for is for people who care about politics, public policy, civic life, uh, those kinds of things. And we have a, a a wonderful, wonderful speech and debate program at Simpson that's won back-to-back -back national championships. Um, and many of the students that I work with are very active in speech and debate. Um, we draw students uh, from around the country. As this map shows, the states in red are states where we've had Culver Fellows um, come, come to us from. Um, and we're always seeking to expand. So you can see a lot of states in the upper Midwest and we're really, seeing a lot more students come as well from Texas, Arizona, California, Colorado, um, those states. Um, students who are in the Culver Fellows Program, they get opportunities for internships, opportunities to work on political campaigns. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a, this is a valuable scholarship. It's $2,000 a year, and that's stackable on top of uh, your base financial aid award. Um, the applications for this fellowship are due February 1 each year. So uh, for those who are currently juniors, mark your calendars for February 1 of next year. Um, that'll be the application deadline. And, and of course, you'll be hearing from us with some reminders and links and all of that. Um, one other item that I wanted to feature that we offer to all Simpson students, whether they're Culver Fellows or not, is a really cool program called the CHIP program, Capitol Hill Internship Program. That's where you spend a full semester living and working in Washington, DC. You earn a full semester's worth of Simpson College credit. Um, students will spend four days a week working at an internship, maybe for a member of Congress, a federal agency, a media outlet, a museum, an embassy. There's the opportunities are limitless in Washington, DC. Um, and everyone lives in, the, in a house uh, just a few blocks from the U.S. Capitol that's jointly owned by Simpson and other colleges that participate in this program. Um, many of our students also get great opportunities in state government. Um, so 
a, I've had a lot of students that have served as clerks in the Iowa legislature or done internships with public policy firms or strategy and communications firms. And we have a really good balance of students that are uh, Democrats and Republicans. So we've got a lot of established relationships with elected officials and prominent folks in state government to help plug you into those opportunities. Um, social media handles for the, for the Culver Center. On Facebook, we're, uh, we're at the Culver Fellows and on Twitter at SC Culver Center. And, and that's where we do most of our communicating about our programming and about our students' accomplishments and experiences. So, do we have any questions, Mark? Okay, sorry about that. I was muted for a second. Okay, so we do, we have some questions that came in. So one of the questions, uh, the first question that came in was, is there a specific year in college when the political internships start opening up? Ah, that's a great question. So one of the, one of the really cool things about a small college and that is located in Iowa, kind of in the nerve center of the political universe is um, you don't have to wait until you're an upperclassman. You don't have to wait till you're a junior or a senior to get these kind of opportunities. Um, I've had a lot of students who are first year students or sophomores who get um, really great internships and clerkships, summer jobs, part-time jobs during the school year um, on political campaigns or in state government. Um, so it's really something that you can dive right into. Although we generally encourage first year students, particularly fall semester of first year, not to jump into too much outside activity right away. Get your feet wet, get comfortable with, with college, um, and then start looking around for those opportunities you know, maybe spring of your first year and certainly the, the summer between first year and, and sophomore year. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> All right, our next question is um, about volunteering. So do volunteer opportunities um, extend into Des Moines or are there sufficient opportunities for all students in the Indianola area? So there are a lot of great opportunities in the immediate Indianola community. Um, we have really um, trusted community partners, nonprofits, social service organizations that, that are always looking for student volunteers and that provide really meaningful, sustaining, you know, sustained kind of relationships. But we also have a, a very large number of community partners in the city of Des Moines and in the, the whole Des Moines area. So um, it really depends on what kinds of volunteer opportunities that you're interested in. Um, but there are, there are more than enough where you wouldn't have to stray too far from campus if you wanted to start out doing volunteering more in the, in the Indianola community. All right, awesome. Um, for the CHIP program, how is it decided where you end up interning for that? That's, that's an outstanding question. So what, what we do at Simpson um, the faculty, the political science uh, faculty, and myself and others is we will support you and help you search for the internship that's a good fit for you. But we don't pick the internships for students. Um, and so it's not like there's a list of, of approved internships or organizations. It's more of an approach of what are you as a student? Usually a juniors do the CHIP program. We've had a couple of sophomores do it during their second semester sophomore year, but usually it's juniors or sometimes seniors. So by that time, you probably have a pretty good idea of what kind of internship you might be interested in. So what we do is help you with the search. We'll help you figure out, okay, I, I wanna, you know, if it's straightforward, like I wanna intern uh, for a member of Congress, then we help you uh, identify members of Congress that are accepting internship applications. We'll help you with your application, um, as will our career development office. Um, so, but a lot of it is up to individual students to pursue areas that interest them with a lot of support from those of us who can help guide you to particularly interesting opportunities or utilize connections that we might have 
or that past students have, you know, maybe had an internship at a particular organization, we can help connect you um, with the hiring, the hiring folks for those kinds of internships. Wonderful. Yeah, okay. I want, to, I want to jump in really quick there. Um, I think Seth touched on it at the end here. I think, you know, when you come into Simpson, like I touched on earlier, that having those relationships is really key and being on a campus like Simpson is really helpful in doing that and that people are really excited to get to know you, um, a specialty, especially faculty. And so I would, you know, definitely really connect with those teachers that you have, really get to know them so that way they know the things you're interested in because sometimes, you know, faculty that have, um, are really connected are able to say hey there's this opportunity I think that you know Scout or uh, Katie might be really good for this. Um, I've done that I work in the admissions office but I worked in politics for the past almost decade and I've done that with current students that you know we just have a good relationship and I know that they'd be a great fit so you, you never know where you might meet someone and make a great connection so I think that's my recommendation is just to you really put yourself out there when you come on campus that way you're able to really make those connections and find um, great fits for those internships yeah that's that's a great point that maddie makes and uh, one example just from my work with students um one of our uh, current graduating seniors um aaron from arizona um, she did the chip program and she had an internship lined up with her member of congress from her home district in arizona but she had already interned with Senator John McCain. Uh, Aaron's a very impressive young woman. Um, and she had, so she had already done an internship with Senator McCain. Um, and so she was looking for something else and she really is very passionate about environmental law. And she said, you know, the, she found this great internship with um, an organization called Earth Justice. They call themselves the, the Earth's Lawyers. Um, and she was having difficulty kind of breaking through and she came to me and I just by chance, I have a former a colleague from a former job that I had, uh, who's the one of the managing directors for Earth Justice and I was able to, you know, send that person an email and say, hey, I have this an unbelievable student who, you know, was really, really eager to do an internship with Earth Justice. Could, could you give her a look? Um, and, and that helped, you know, get her application to the top of the stack. Um, so definitely utilize the, the connections and the experience that, that your professors and staff members and others have. And I would add alumni of Simpson. That's one of the other great things about going to Simpson is the alumni network is there to help the current students and they love doing it. They would love to you know, host you, help you find a great internship, give you advice, serve as a mentor, it's a really, um, uh, it's a really supportive community in that way. All right, it looks like our next question is, do you have to be a Culver Fellow to be connected with the Culver Center? No, not at all. Um, the Culver Fellows program is small compared to the overall size of the school. We've got currently, including our graduating seniors, I think 37 or 38, uh, students actively enrolled. That'll increase uh, with uh, the incoming class this fall, um, which looks to be pretty, pretty solid, pretty large. Um, but we have over 1,200 students at Simpson, so it's not just for those 40 or 50 students that are Culver Fellows. The Culver Center works with every member of the Simpson community, students, faculty, and staff. Anyone who is interested in exploring politics, um, political policy issue, uh, public, sorry, public policy issue. Um, I've worked with faculty in almost every academic department in one way or another. And I've worked with a lot of students who are not Culver Fellows, but who are interested in some aspect of politics or policy. Um, the fellowship is a great way to have kind of a core group of students um, that, that do this work and, and develop their leadership skills. But the Culver Center is there to serve the entire community. All right, thank you. And then um, are there any additional scholarships for the CHIP program during the May and summer terms? So the CHIP program runs during the regular semester. So you, if you do CHIP, it's either the fall semester or the spring semester. Um, so we don't do CHIP during May term or summer. 
we are available, faculty and staff are available to help students that might want to do an internship in DC during the summer, but it would be outside of the, the formal SHIP program. And to answer the, and it's kind of a related issue, um, the CHIP program, you pay your regular tuition to Simpson for that semester and they, that gets applied for your CHIP program experience. And then the housing costs are only a tiny bit more to live in DC than they are to stay on campus. Um, and that's the big benefit of owning the house. You know, because we're, we are part, Simpson is part of a consortium of uh, mostly Methodist affiliated schools that operate the CHIP program. That group of schools owns that house. Um, so uh, the, it's, the housing is a lot cheaper than if you just tried to go rent an apartment in Washington, D.C., which is prohibitively expensive for most people. All right, are there any more questions for either Seth or Maddie? I put our um, email addresses in the chat. So if you can't think of something now, or if there's anything later that you have questions about, or you just want to chat with us one-on-one, -on -one, you definitely can do that. We're, we're always here for you guys. So anytime you need anything, just let us know. All right, looks like we're wrapping up here. So I just want to thank everyone for jumping on. Um, feel free to join us for the next couple of sessions. Um, we'll be wrapping up here at the end of May, and we're really looking forward to seeing all of you seniors this incoming fall, and looking forward to connecting with all of you underclassmen um, through the next year or a couple years here. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>